building now, and we'll get into what those are. So the, the thing that we've done over the years is we've, in, we, we've increased the length of what we call the gauntlet for ActiveX controls. So originally the gauntlet just consisted of, you'd ask the control, hey, are you safe to run in the web? And the control would come back and say, I sure am. And a lot of times this was because the control was intended for design in the web, running on the web. But sometimes it was just because that's how a popular framework like Borland Delphi would automatically create ActiveX controls. And so people would build ActiveX controls with this idea that, oh, we're just going to use it within our application and so forth. And then suddenly you find out that the money ActiveX control was marked safe for scripting and could be called from Internet Explorer. And that was a security conference like 13 years ago or something. And that was the big O day of the day. So something else went on. We, we basically, we introduced a new, a new measure to the gauntlet, and that's kill bits. Basically, the ability to have a list of ActiveX controls that is rolled out through central update mechanisms saying, this control can't be run in the browser. And so, basically, if a vendor finds a vulnerability in their ActiveX control that they, they need to ensure that, that control doesn't run within the browser, they contact secure at Microsoft.com, and they get that control flagged as kill bitting. That control will no longer load. Then we've got our, our traditional, hey, are you safe to run in the browser, I object safety, are you safe for initialization? And essentially, we've, we've improved our guidance there. We've, we've shored up our tor toolkits a bit. But still, we're relying on the control to tell us whether or not it should be allowed in the browser. Internet Explorer 7 introduced one of the most unheralded but most important attack surface reductions against the IE stack called ActiveX opt-in. What ActiveX opt-in did was it took, by default, the majority of ActiveX controls off the attack surface of the browser. By default, any ActiveX control that just happened to be on your system, not installed through the browser, became unavailable. So you had to use an information bar to, prevent, to, to allow that control to be run. And so what this did is it prevented controls that just were vulnerable, but never intended for use in the browser, the SharePoint log management control, you know, things like that, from running automatically. And so in IE6, you could visit a website and it would do a drive-by against you. Basically, it would go have this iframe that has 50 different ActiveX control exploits and would try and load them all and try and take over your machine. When you visit that site in IE7, usually what you'd get is basically an information bar saying Internet Explorer blocks some controls in this site. And you click the drop down to see what it is and it's like 40 long. And you're like, wow, I don't understand why this thing wants to use the WinZip ActiveX control. So we made a major change there. We took tons of stuff off the attack surface. But it wasn't enough. And the reason it wasn't enough is because there's some ActiveX controls that are intended for use in the web, absolutely, unconditionally. But they don't need to be used everywhere. So a prime example of this is the ActiveX control used for media playback at one of the major, one of the major uh, three web portals. You know, they've got their own music jukebox, right? And they have an ActiveX control that plays music. And it's fine, it's wonderful, except, oops, they wrote it, there's a buffer overflow, and you, know, you can actually take people's computers over with this. Okay, well if it only ran on their site, that would be okay because they're not gonna exploit the vulnerability, but other people can. And so for a long time, we've had a template, what's called the site lock template, that would allow a vendor to make their ActiveX control only run on the website from which it came. But it turns out that most people aren't using this. Partly it's an issue of it hasn't been evangelized enough, partly it's an issue of they, they just haven't gotten around to it, they don't have the source anymore, and so forth. Well, what we've done in IE8 is we looked at what SiteLock did in terms of attack surface, and we said, that's so good, we have to give users this feature by default. So Internet Explorer 8, by default, makes ActiveX controls per site. When you go to a website and it installs an ActiveX control, by default, that ActiveX control is only available from the site that gave it to you. And so what this ensures is, in the case of that music player vulnerability and so forth, that control just isn't available on your attack surface to attack you. You can manage this yourself. You can, you can opt that control in for other sites if you want, and you can take it out. So if there's a really you know, nice plugin that's critical to lots of web functionality, but it's misused by advertisers all the time, boy, that's annoying. You can make it run from nowhere by default and then manually approve. And so you, know, you can reduce your own attack surface as an end user by making controls only useful from the sites that you trust and you allow to run code. And so this gauntlet has only gotten longer. Now, we looked at some other things. One of the other things that we looked at is, what can we do as defense in depth? We know there's gonna be vulnerable controls. We know there's gonna be vulnerable controls that were you know, just written for the web. Everybody expects them to run on the web, but oops, there's a memory vulnerability. So, what did we do? Well, 
Windows Vista was the first OS to really push out one of our, our significant things around data execution prevention. So data execution prevention is a feature of modern processors and the operating system to keep track of which pages in memory are meant to be executable and which pages are meant to be just data. And if the processor encounters a page that's marked to be just data, your stack or your heap or whatnot, and it tries to, it's about to execute code from it, it says, wait a minute, this page wasn't marked as executable. So rather than running that shell code, that exploit code that provides access to your computer, the, the operating system just terminates the process. So this feature became available in, in, in Vista on IE7, and it would have been one of the most valuable things we could have done to reduce attack surface. There was a problem. Almost all ActiveX controls at the time were written in ATL in versions that came with Visual Studio 2003 and earlier. ATL was not compatible with data execution prevention. So had we turned this on in IE7 on Windows Vista, we would have broken pretty much every ActiveX control that was out there. We thought about it pretty hard anyway, because the attack surface reduction was huge, but ultimately it was decided that no, people won't install a browser if it doesn't work on most of the sites they care about. We can't do that. Well, time has changed, and fortunately the Windows team, recognizing the importance of getting data execution prevention available everywhere, made changes to the latest service packs and the latest versions of Windows to provide an API called Set Process Depth Policy. And basically what Set Process Depth Policy does is it allows you to opt into depth while making sure ATL stuff still works. And so by default, Internet Explorer 8 on Windows Vista SP1, Windows Server 2008, Windows XP SP3, uh, and so on, the latest versions of all the service packs, will turn data execution prevention on by default. Now this is great because it shields the add-on vulnerabilities as well as Internet Explorer memory related vulnerabilities as well. So if there's a parser bug or an HTTP stack bug or an ActiveX control memory related vulnerability, data execution prevention can help mitigate that. Now there's a bunch of other memory stuff you might have heard about for Vista. You've got ASLR, Safe SEH, GS, and so forth. Internet Explorer basically opts into all of the defenses available. And we've gone out to the partners, major ActiveX control vendors, and we've worked with them to get the latest versions of their controls compiled with these options too, all to mitigate this code execution possibility. The last thing I'll mention on this slide is, you know, oh wow, process crash. It's a good crash because shell code didn't run, but it's pretty annoying. Internet Explorer 8 introduces a new architecture called loosely coupled IE. Loosely coupled IE basically ensures that the browser frame and the browser tabs run in separate independent processes, such that if the browser tab processes crash, they can either be recovered automatically, or in the case of a depth crash, we don't want to give the bad guy another shot, so we just show the page shown here, basically explaining to the user that there's been an incompatibility to discover it and so forth, and giving them the option to either try again if it's a site they trust, or get out of there if they were just kind of randomly surfing around. And so, loosely coupled IE has a bunch of benefits that percolate throughout the system. Of crashes in Internet Explorer, something like 70% are caused by third-party code. If you run IE without add-ons, it's usually way faster and way more stable. So, part of our job is to get, get add-ons written better, but part of our job is also to be more robust in recovering in the event of a crash. Quiz for the audience. What's the safest block of C++ code? One that's never written, obviously. So this is a principle, right? You make things faster by not running code. You can also make things more secure by not running code. Internet Explorer 8 includes a bunch of new non-binary extensibility. Traditional security guys look at me and they're like, that's not security. Well, it is actually, because if you don't have either unskilled or uh, hurried or, or otherwise uh, people who are generating code that's not very well written, and you give them safer alternatives that allow them to achieve their goals faster, more re reliably, and more securely, they'll take them. And so IE8 includes accelerators, web slices, visual search suggestions, and a bunch of new goodies for Ajax. And so we're going to briefly fly through them. Accelerators. Basically, accelerators uh, are an XML manifest that you can put on your site that users can install, and then your service becomes available from the Internet Explorer context menu. So you can do things like look up definitions, do translations, map, all of the things that a lot of the websites are trying to do today. You can you know, add them to the aggregation sites like Dig and so forth. And now you don't have to have a browser plug-in that's slowing up your startup performance and otherwise impairing your ability. You're able to do things much more quickly. Web slices. 
the ability to put some of the web content into the frame. So rather than having some you know, sidebar gadget or some standalone browser toolbar that tells you what a stock price is or the weather is or whatnot, basically, again, XML manifest pointing to, uh, uh, it's, it's done through the RSS feed system actually, but most of the implementation details are hidden from you, the programmer. And basically all you do is you mark up parts of your site, a slice if you will, and the user can add that slice to their favorites bar. And so they get an updating piece of content that's available from their favorites bar, no add-on. When they want to get rid of it, they just right-click and choose delete. But the performance is much better, and of course, the security, much better. We've improved our manage add-ons experience in IE8. Basically, we made the dialog resizable, woo-hoo. Uh, we did a bunch of stuff around enabling the user to copy the data out of this. So if your browser is crashing all the time, you can just go in here, select all copy to a spreadsheet and mail it off to somebody to analyze it. So there's some websites on the web that'll do that and say, oh, this is the plugin that's known to crash all the time. We also did a, a toolbar advisor in IE8. So when we load up and we determine that you've got a toolbar that's gonna cause a compatibility or security problem, we notify you and allow you to disable it. And then also this other, the other thing this thing does is it shows you the load time of add-ons. So if you say, geez, IE is super duper slow. You know, what's going on? you're likely to get asked, hey, go up into manage add-ons and see how long add-ons are taking. And sometimes you'll see an add-on that's taking four seconds every time you create a tab. And you can say, hmm, it's not really that valuable, I'm gonna get rid of that one. Protected mode. Protected mode was a feature for Internet Explorer 7. It's available again in Internet Explorer 8. Protected mode is, is kind of the ultimate backstop against these, these problems where if bad guys get code running on your machine, that code runs with low integrity. It's essentially a sandbox that sits around the browser and ensures that you can't write into critical file system places like the startup folders, you can't install programs, and so forth. One of the nice things about IE's loosely coupled IE architecture is previously you couldn't have a window that contained content from the internet and content from your intranet at the same time because in Internet Explorer 7, each window was its own process and each, you know, all the tabs in that window ran in the same process and a process can only have one integrity level. Well, with IE8, now you can have tabs running with different integrity levels. So the user experience annoyance that was introduced in IE7 has been mitigated. We've done some other stuff. Uh, we've moved the intranet zone to medium integrity, so out of protected mode by default. This is a performance improvement. Uh, if for some reason you don't trust your local intranet, you can actually go back and put it the way that it was before. But the primary reason that the intranet was running in low before was the, uh, the user experience issues. Made some minor API improvements, so if you're a plugin, you can interact better with protected mode. One of the other things we saw over the past two years or so is people misusing application protocols. So an application protocol, in this case, I think it's the, uh, the OneNote colon protocol. Application protocols are a way for a website to pass data to a program running on your computer. Now, last summer, you might have heard about the, there was an application uh, protocol vulnerability within Firefox, and so, basically browse to a site in Internet Explorer and it would launch Firefox and go abuse Firefox's vulnerability. And the Firefox guys, they fixed their vulnerability. It turns out that uncovered a whole chain of vulnerabilities elsewhere in Windows. But one of, the, one of the problems was Internet Explorer wouldn't notify the user when launching an app protocol. So in ActiveX control, you get an information bar, tons of security around it. But if you had an app protocol installed, basically bad guy knows about it, bang, you're owned. And so what we did with app protocols is we introduced the prompt. Now we hate prompts. Prompts suck. Users don't like prompts. The reason that we had to have a prompt essentially is back to that compatibility and balance. If we just disabled app protocols, well, people wouldn't upgrade because their app protocols didn't work. Turns out these are used more broadly than most people think. Uh, but at the same time, there's really no way to programmatically, automatically determine where, whether anything is malicious or not. So sometimes we have to delegate the trust decision to the user, even though we hate it. Moving nicely to the next topic, social engineering. Delegating trust to the user is a problem. Humans aren't wired for the kind of trust decisions that they're being asked to make today. Trust decision here, do I get in the boat? Pretty easy, no. Well, it's a little more subtle. Do I get in the water? Uh, no, I don't think so. Basically, it's relatively easy within nature to you know, see what the aggressors are, the attackers are, and of course, they're always working harder and harder to uh, you know, camouflage themselves. Unfortunately, in a digital world, if you're a bad guy, it's really easy to camouflage yourself as a legitimate thing. So we've done some work in IE7. We introduced a phishing filter in IE7. We've done some more work in IE8. One of the things we did in IE8 is domain highlighting. 
Now, for a certain class of users, this is helpful because they can more easily determine what website they're on. So essentially what we do is we highlight the host name of the site you're on. And so in the case of a 